OK, hi, everybody. There's still quite a few people who were registered who aren't with us, but hopefully they'll either join us or uh, I don't know, I have to get the recording. So a very good evening to you and thank you so, so much for joining me on this really special day, the 80th anniversary of the first SOE F section wireless message to be sent from France and to be received here um, in the United Kingdom. First of all, I would very much like to thank uh, Nick Fox, who has provided me with a lot of information. We've collaborated on this talk. Um, so Nick is with us this evening, although you won't be hearing his voice yet. <laughs> um, but if you have any questions at the end, myself and Nick uh, will be happy to field them. Uh, with that in mind, we've got you muted and with um, cameras off, trying a new thing this evening. Um, but if you do have any questions, the chat facility is there. I will only be looking at it at the end, though, otherwise I'll get myself massively confused. I'm also very aware that there is uh, an incredibly special guest in the audience. Um, so uh, we will wait and see um, if she wishes to say anything at the end as well. As most of you know, if you've met me before and if you haven't, I'm Dr. Kate Vigers. Um, on Tuesday, my book, Mission France by Yale University Press, is being released out into the big wide world, although uh, it's already in some bookshops already. And I've been running these lockdown lectures over the last year as a way of uh, giving back, giving some of the information that I've learned over the years, but also as a way of uh, trying to raise a little money to keep myself going because I've been out of work for the last year, although things are looking better. So if you enjoy, enjoy this evening's talk, there's a PayPal link at the bottom of this screen. There'll be one at the end. Um, a small donation, which myself and Nick will split. Some of the money will go to the World War II Secret Learning Network. Uh, and some of it will go towards the administrative costs of putting these lectures on. So if you feel so inclined, your bus fare or the, the price of a G&T that you might have bought me afterwards would be absolutely marvellous. The last thing to say is, I don't know how after all these years of studying France, but I don't actually speak French. There may be some mispronunciations in this lecture this evening. I do apologise. It's not uh, out of laziness. It's not out of uh, anything else. I hope I don't offend um, if I do mispronounce some names or some name places. I'm doing my best. And I had a French lesson the other night with a friend to try and help me through this. So apologies. So let us begin on this rather auspicious day, the 9th of May. Ooh. I hope you can all hear me and I hope you can all see the screen. I haven't seen any messages to the contrary. So, uh, yeah, let me click away. If you'd looked up into the moonlit sky above Valencay at 1.30 a.m. on the night of the 5th, 6th of May 1941, you would have witnessed the most extraordinary sight. A Whitley bomber would have been silhouetted against a full moon, circling several times before revealing its cargo. A small white parachute would be seen against the night sky, its canopy billowing out before twisting and turning as the bod beneath struggled to keep control. The aircraft banked, dipped its wings in salute and returned home, leaving the parachutists completely alone. He landed on his feet in a field known as La Abo Pinière. And with that, he became the first ever F section agent to arrive in France. His wireless set, the tool of his trade, landed with him. However, he was alone. He had jumped blind, meaning there was no one there to greet him, no one to help, making him probably feel vulnerable. He buried his parachute according to orders and set out to make his first contact. The landing of this one man marked the start of F sections activities, which grew in total to some 75 different circuits or networks, involving some 400 British trained SOE agents and thousands of locally recruited sub agents from the French population. Together, they did so much to arm, train and lead French resistance movements to carry out sabotage in preparation for and during the Allied invasion in June of 1944. This extraordinary man whose work we commemorate today is Georges Begay. Born in 1911 in Perigot, France, he spent some time in Egypt as a child. He trained as an engineer at the University of Hull, where he learned English and where he met his wife. In 1934, he was called up for national service in the French Army, where he trained as a signaller and as a wireless operator. 
At the outbreak of war, he was working as a car salesman, but was recalled to the army and posted as NCO in charge of a brigade radio section. Owing to the fact he spoke English, he was attached to the British Expeditionary Force as a liaison officer in January of 1940, and he managed to escape to Britain during the Dunkirk evacuation. He was demobbed from the French army and joined the British. On the 13th of August 1940, he was posted to One Signals Training Centre at Catrick as signalman under the assumed name George Robert Noble. Despite passing the NCO's course, he was used as a technical instructor for Royal Signals recruits and at some stage was posted to the Royal Signals First Holding Regiment at Scarborough, where he was allowed to practice high speed morse. It was there that he was talent spotted by Major Thomas Cadet, a pre-war Paris correspondent of the BBC, who was now working in the French section of the Special Operations Executive, or the SOE. SOE had been founded some months before in July of 1940. Its objective was to coordinate and assist local clandestine activity against the Axis powers and their occupying forces in territories across Europe and beyond. SOE would liaise with, equip, train and arm the local resistance so that when the time came, they could pave the way for the invading forces of D-Day and fight back against the occupiers. The SOE would assist with sabotage and subversion on every level, from smaller acts of resistance such as false intelligence and propaganda, to cutting power lines, derailing trains uh, and blowing up factories. They would do all of this in spite of the Nazi threat that any passive or active opposition to the German armed forces would incur the most severe of retaliatory measures. Before joining SOE, Begay had to be security cleared by MI5, and on the 17th of February 1941, he attended the first agent training school at Special Training School, or STS-5, at Wanborough Manor in Surrey. His course report, which is held in his personnel file at the National Archives at Kew, reports he had dash and initiative, a natural leader, reserved and efficient. Just two weeks afterwards, or after attending this training course, Begay was detached from this course to attend special wireless training at the SIS-run Station 8, formerly Wadden Hall, near Milton Keynes. Until SOE was able to establish its own wireless training and communication schools, it used SIS, that's the Secret Intelligence Service, uh, properties. To enable agents to be infiltrated into the interior of France, there were several means of transport available. There were Lysanders, which were small landing aircraft. I'll show you an image of those later. Some arrived by Felucca by sea and then traveled uh, inland by train or uh, car or bus, or there was a parachute. And Begay was trained in the latter at STS-51 Ringway Aerodrome, now Manchester International Airport in early April. Training would involve jumping from a stationary balloon as well as day and night drops from an aircraft. Successful uh, candidates were awarded their parachute wings. Begay's training concluded at SOE's finishing school at Bewley in the New Forest. Here he was tested on the use of his wireless set and received seven hours private tuition on special subjects. His report dated the 29th of April, said he possessed a very alert, capable brain, a reserved but very pleasant personality, thorough, painstaking and discreet, an excellent man. George was commissioned on completion of his training and became second Lieutenant George Robert Noble on the general list on the 30th of April 1941. However, this photograph from his personnel file suggests that he was actually commissioned into the Intelligence Corps. He was briefed for his mission and given the code name Bombproof. Now, this is a rather macabre reference to the fact that he'd survived an air raid in which a bomb landed on his safe house in London, killing his two colleagues, but leaving him unscathed. The mission for which he was briefed was challenging and groundbreaking in every respect. He was to establish himself in or near Chateau Roux and set up his radio. He was to find and transmit a contact address to which messages could be sent by other agents once they got to France, known as a live letterbox. He would then act as their link to London, effectively forming the foundations for the series of networks across France, 
He would also have to find and recruit local contacts to assist with the subsequent arrival of other agents. Georges was also given the details of this man, Max Imon. He was a pre-war socialist politician now living in Valence. He'd managed to smuggle a letter out of France saying he wanted to serve the Allied course. The letter found its way to SOEF section and Georges was briefed to meet and recruit him. On the 5th of May 1941, Georges and his conducting officer were driven to RAF Stradisol, stopping en route at RAF Henlo to pick up his parachute along with his radio and entrenching tool which had been fitted to it. They then left by air, landing at RAF Tangmere on the south coast for final preparations. Once final checks had been made, including checking his pockets for things that might give him away as being from England, like um, cinema or bus tickets or cigarettes, he was given a parachute or strip tea suit to wear over his French civilian clothing and strapped into his parachute harness. As he left the UK in a Whitley bomber, don't worry, I do know this is a Lysander and I am coming back to why I've used this particular picture. But as he left the UK in a Whitley bomber of 1419 flight RAF, he became the first ever SOE agent, an organisation which would become the stuff of legend. Much has been made of the fact that he was dropped miles from his planned drop zone or DZ, but this is going to be addressed. There were in fact two potential dropping points the choice of which was left to the pilot. Both were close to wood, so he could easily bury his parachute harness and other equipment. One was about 13 kilometers from Valence, and the other just under three kilometers from where he was actually dropped, which was about 18 kilometers from Valence in a direct line, but even further on country roads. The pilot, in fact, did well to get as close as he did, the first leg from Normandy coast to Tours was relatively easy, following the River Loire reflecting the moonlight. But mist obscured their next visual markers, and so the aircraft had to return to Tours and then followed the river on to Chateau Roux. And that's why I've chosen this painting, because although it is the wrong aircraft, it is the right river with Tours in the background there. And this was the marker that all pilots used who dropped SOE agents. And so they really only had this river um, which they could follow. They then uh, went to the Roman road to Vatin, heading from the, uh, for the alternative dropping zone. The pilot later reported the passenger was dropped approximately half a mile south of the pinpoint given to us. His parachute seemed to open successfully and he appeared to make a good landing. Of course, this is the last the pilot would ever see or probably hear of the bod that he had uh, just dropped. In fact, he was dropped about three kilometres to the southeast of the alternative drop point onto a ploughed field. This was a blind drop. This means there was nobody waiting for him on the ground with torches or bonfires to mark the correct drop zone. No one had been recruited yet. The pilot and crew were unfamiliar with the landscape below and they only had a small map, <coughs> probably an air recce photo. Their navigation aids were a stopwatch, clock, a compass, airspeed indicator to time the distances of each leg. The last identifiable spots were probably the town of Vertin and then the Roman road, and then they were over dark countryside. It is quite possible they mistook one road for another. Begay wrote an account of his drop <clears throat> in which he said, in the days before the flight, I'd carefully studied the aerial photographs of the region in order to orient myself more easily after having landed. When I jumped, it was about 0130 in the middle of the night, but then the moon shone. I had serious problems because my transmitter hanging over my head turned in one direction and I had a hard time not doing much in the other. I landed on my feet smoothly in a ploughed field where I quickly buried my parachute. The twists and turns he suffered were typical of this type of parachute, the A-type, which was based on a World War I balloon observer's equipment. His radio and other equipment were attached to his rigging lines above him, which meant he could not pull on the risers to counteract drift or avoid an obstacle. Georges made this sketch of his landing when he revisited the site in 1982. Having landed, <clears throat> excuse me, buried his parachute and tidied himself up, he located the main road, RN20, and headed on foot towards Vertin, dressed in a suit and raincoat, carrying his radio in a suitcase. He said, a bistro had just opened its doors and I entered quietly to drink a hot coffee. 
It was at the corner of the road, which I also had to take to reach Valencay, the first objective of my mission. But he was convinced he'd been dropped in the wrong spot. He was prepared for a 13 kilometer walk to Valencay to meet Max Emol, but in the eventuality, it was more like 24 kilometers with an incredibly heavy wireless set to carry, about 32 pounds. Being unfamiliar with the local surroundings, his journey was no mean feat. He said that once uh, he got there, he hurried to the post office to find Max Emon's address in the telephone directory and then went to his house. However, he discovered from the maid that he was out for the day and so he booked into this hotel. To avoid suspicion, deflect questions and justify his presence, he said he'd come to make sketches of the chateau. It was only the next day, May the 7th, that he met at last his contact. And that's paraphrasing George's own words. The following day, Georges Beguet went to meet Max Imon at his house just on the edge of the town centre. But the men were very unsure of each other. Max was suspicious that Georges was an imposter sent to trap him, and Georges wasn't sure if it was the real Max Imon in front of him. However, to convince Max, Georges presented André Labat's driving licence, which the owner had handed over to the SOE in London, and on which Labat had written, you can trust the person who will hand this document to you. Max hid him in the cellar to avoid the maid and his wife, and on the 8th of May took him to Chateau Row, where he introduced him to some of his fellow socialists. Georges recruited his first live letterbox the same evening, a chemist, Monsieur Renan, of 50 fru, uh, 54, I beg your pardon, Rue de Marin. Georges then found a room at the 14 Rue de Pavillon, which he said was poorly situated, but suitable for his first radio contact with London. Again, this is not a picture of our agent, but does give a good idea of the kind of work he undertook. On the 9th of May, 1941, 80 years ago today, Georges Beguet made the first ever encrypted radio contact with London, only four days after leaving the United Kingdom. It said, landed okay, contact with Frederick. Frederick induced me to Henri Renan at 54 Rue de Marine at Chateau Rue. Renan will be my mailbox. Again, apologies about the French. SOE's first radios, they were large, clumsy, and required huge amounts of power. They were designed and manufactured, um, sorry, the SOE designed and manufactured their own, such as the Paracet, so-called because it could be dropped by parachute, under the direction of Lieutenant Colonel Nichols, who was of the Royal Signals, and he served with Gubbins ahead of SOE between the wars. The A Mark III, with its batteries and accessories, weighed approximately nine pounds or 4.1 kilos and could spit into a small briefcase. That's the one on the right of the image. But the one that Georges had was the B Mark II, also known as the B2, which weighed a staggering 32 pounds or 15 kilos. And this was required to work over ranges greater than about 500 miles. Using such a wireless set, Beguet forged the first link between France and London, in which he also arranged the drop of further agents and requested more money, something that would become quite a theme over the years of SOE's existence. The agents arrived in the form of Pierre de Voncourt, who parachuted on the 9th of the 10th, 11th of May to a drop zone about 60 kilometres northwest of Chateau Roux to set up the Auto Giro circuit, the first of F section 75 plus circuits. He was followed by Roger Catin on the 12th, 13th of May. He was spotted as he landed and was put under house arrest. He later worked as an administrator for the Vichy government, but played no further role in the SOE or the resistance. Now that reminds me, I've forgotten to tell you that at this stage, France was divided into two. There was a demarcation line down the middle, the occupied zone run by the Nazis, and the unoccupied zone, or Vichy, which was run by the puppet uh, president, if you like, uh, Pétain. Uh, and this is where these agents were operating. It's also worth noting at this point that these were the first F section agents, but they had been preceded by several BCRA and DF section agents, including a party of five French officers and NCOs led by Captain Berge, who were dropped just a few weeks before on the 15th of March in Brittany. Amongst them was Joël Latac, who subsequently established the important RF um, circuit, which uh, the name is getting stuck on my page, Overcloud. 
For Georges, the plan was, quote, if all went well, Pierre was to visit his brother Philippe, who lived on his estate at Brignac, not far from Limoges. Cotin was to go to Paris, where he worked before the war, and Pierre was to rejoin them in Paris. Then the pianist, that's a nickname for a wireless operator, Beguet, would set up the first radio. Sorry, that was my mobile phone, which is actually switched off, so that's bizarre. Uh, they would set up the first uh, radio post and try to establish the first circuit. Beguet is sometimes known as Georges One, as he was the first SOE wireless operator in France. Subsequent wireless operators were known as Georges II, Georges III, and so on, until it became far too confusing as more and more were sent into the field. Pierre de Vancourt reached his brother's house safely. He learned with relief that his wife and children, whom he had left behind almost a year ago, were well in his Paris apartment. His brother, Philippe, immediately offered to work with them for SOE and told him that their eldest brother, Jean, would also join them. Within a few days, the three brothers and two of Philippe's friends, the Marquis de Moustier and Henri Sevenet, began to organize, organize Auto Giro. They decided their first meeting with Beguet and Cotin would be at Chateau Rau rather than in Paris, and the two SOE officers came south. They all agreed that Jean de Vomcourt should operate a circuit at Montalia in the German occupied zone where he had an estate. Philippe would stay in the unoccupied Vichy zone, building up his network based on the Mauge, where he could count on many local supporters. Pierre, Roger and Beguet would go to Paris, where Pierre would use his house as a temporary foothold. On the 13th of June 1941, the very first drop of wartime supplies was made to France. In total, some 60,000 would be dropped over the course of the war. The first two containers were dropped at the fourth attempt by an Armstrong Whitworth Whitley close to Philippe de Vomcourt's chateau at Bas Soleil, some 10 miles east of Limoges. But the drop attracted unwanted attention when one of the containers got caught on the wing of the Whitley, which circled for nearly an hour before the container finally freed itself and dropped. The sheer excitement at receiving such equipment was unprecedented. It brought hope and a practical way to fight back against the occupiers. The resistance now knew that they could be armed and prepared for the fight. Inside these first containers were Tommy guns, fighting knives, plastic explosive, and somewhat bizarrely limpet mines with delay fuses for use against ships, which was an odd choice given that the drop zone was over 100 miles from the sea. But it didn't matter, because no matter how inappropriate the supplies were, the drop marked a huge success story. And this was the result of the wireless message sent by Beguet and the beginning of a new era in World War II communications. Beguet had an exhausting schedule, often transmitting and receiving messages to and from SOE three times a day, and the scheds or schedule transmissions caused no amount of difficulties for him. German wireless interception had detected his transmissions almost immediately and began to jam them in less than a week, but it's not as straightforward as that. The Milice, the French police collaborators, had been given orders to look for anyone new in the area, and although the German direction finders also joined in the search, um, it was a complicated situation. The Germans had a very effective radio direction finding capability using fixed sites in German, major German cities. However, even if they passed details to their colleagues in Paris, they were not yet active in the unoccupied zone in which Chateau Rue sat. The French police did not have DF vehicles, they weren't mobile, but they did request that the French army set up under the armistice use theirs. The army seems to have been reluctant to do so, or certainly to do so effectively, which is probably why in uh, early 1942, the French Vichy Prime Minister Laval allowed the Germans to deploy theirs in the unoccupied zone. Nevertheless, Georges did report that his communications to and from London were always jammed or often jammed. As a result, Beguet realised he needed to keep transmission times as short as possible. Eventually, SOE wireless recruits were told no more than 20 minutes on air. That was to code, send, receive and decode a message. But Beguet is credited with coming up with a solution and proposed using the BBC message personnel broadcast on Radio Londres. The first three were Lizette Vabien, Gabrielle Vabien, Claude Vabien. 
the origin of the SOE's use of the massage personnel. Now, this system used by the BBC was set up as a way for uh, relatives who had evacuated during the Dunkirk evacuation to communicate with one or another across the channel. But it was a great way for the UK to communicate with F section agents or SOE agents. And it fooled the Germans because they thought that they were in code and they wasted a lot of time trying to decipher them. But in fact, they were only prearranged with specific people. They were to announce drops of agents or arms or ordering attacks on prearranged targets. So it would only be certain people listening out for those particular words. But it was some months before they could be put into practice. And in the summer and autumn, F section was dogged with troubles. The wireless operators had to make do with inadequate and overused communication channels. In fact, all SOE traffic for and from the growing number of agents in the occupied and unoccupied zones pass through just one channel, thus endangering anyone who used it. And that channel did not belong to the SOE. It belonged to the Secret Intelligence Service, SIS or MI6, an organisation which was highly critical of SOE's activities, regarding them to be amateurish and inexperienced. Having their wireless traffic not only go through SIS, but also to be judged by them was not a satisfactory arrangement. Even more so because it was agreed that the head of SIS had the right to reject any message that he deemed to compromise his own organization's security, meaning not all the messages would get through. Despite being the senior service, SIS had only recently started to use wireless technology itself and really didn't have the claim to being the experts when it came to clandestine communications, but that's a whole other story. Until June of 1942, SIS received SOE's wireless traffic at its receiving stations at Nash, which was five miles west of Bletchley for Scandinavian traffic and nearby Wadden Hall for European communication. As for Bletchley Park itself, which all people often assume has a link, I'm sorry to say it is a very tenuous one. Bletchley was bought by the head of SIS, Hugh Sinclair, in June of 1938 for some £6,000, and it was to become the wartime base for SIS and the Government Code and Cipher School, otherwise known as GC and CS, the forerunner to GCHQ. In September 1938, during the Munich crisis, head office and GC and CS staff were transferred to Bletchley before moving back to London once the crisis subsided. In early 1939, a 24-hour SIS communication service with four transmitters and six receivers was set up there. Members of one of SOE's forebears, S uh, Section D, also moved to Bletchley in early 1939 to develop sabotage material, including incendiaries and plastic explosives. But as war loomed, SIS and GC and CS moved to Bletchley Park. But the former soon returned to London while the codebreakers stayed on. Back in France, Beguet had an exhausting schedule and often had to undertake courier work, travelling by train to deliver or receive messages to other SOE agents. The risk of exposure was further increased by the use of postcards as a means of communication between agents. Georges said, I received a first postcard from Albert, who was uh, Roger Cotin I mentioned earlier, operating in Brittany, France since the 13th of May. He gave me an address and requested money, then a second giving another address and then a third from Paris in code, which requires several hours deciphering. Additionally, he was at risk due to the amount of time he had to transmit and the time he spent on air. He described his daily routine. 0700 to midday, uh, making radio contact. 1300 to 1600, deciphering. 1600 to 1800, letter drops, shopping, meets with contacts. 2000 to 2400 and later coding. The current was often cut in the morning around 1000 or 10 a.m. when I was transmitting. To avoid this, dangerous for my security, I requested earlier transmitting times, first 0800 and then 0700 in the morning. He also complained that de Bomcourt's messages were not as short or as abbreviated as they needed to be. He started to use what he called telegrams, which were rush signals, using 50 groups of letters as a maximum, meaning less decoding. There was also the size of the equipment to consider, as the radio sets, as I've described, were bulky to hide away and heavy and conspicuous to carry when he visited towns such as Limoges, Lyon and Clermont-Ferrand to find new transmitting locations. 
Faced with considerable traffic to code and send, then receive and decode for operations like this, <coughs> he proposed a system of abbreviated text, reducing messages to initials. For example, Freddy Whitley operation will take place tonight, an operation for Agent Freddy using a Whitley bomber aircraft to become FWOWTPT. An N meant postponement and an OK meant it would go ahead. This would be broadcast between 0900 and 1100 hours, 1430 and 1530, 1725 and 1740. Timings for his clandestine work were often incredibly tight. On one occasion, he had planned a parachute drop at Loche, some 15 kilometers from Chateau Roux, and sent a, kilometer, sorry, a courier on the 1810 train to give de Voncourt an, uh, an update on the operation. At 16.15, 15 minutes after he had decoded a message from London and hidden his set, the police arrived to search his room. As soon as they left, having found nothing, he was due back on air to get an update. He just got it up in time to rush to the station to tell the courier to inform de Voncourt that the drop had been postponed. In addition to his radio work, Georges was busy, busy extending his contacts through Max Imon's associates wrecking parachute dropping zones and attending reception committees for new agents by parachute. On the 3rd of October, Major Jerry Morel, who had arrived by the first F section Lysander operation on the 23rd of August 1941, just south of Chateau Roux, was arrested. The first in a catastrophic chain of events. On the 4th of October, the gariste, uh, the garage worker Marcel Florette, Begay's live letterbox in Chateau Roux was also arrested. His name and address had been found on Morel. Another agent was arrested while waiting for a meeting with Georges. Mrs. Florette's arrest was followed by that of F section agent Michael Trotterbus and a local recruit uh, whose name I'm not going to attempt to pronounce, but Jean was caught through a Vichy police surveillance operation mounted at the garage. Georges was warned of Florette's arrest by Max Imon and left the area to carry on his transmissions elsewhere. He went later to Limoges, then Perigot, and then to Marseille, where he was arrested on the 24th of October when he called at a so-called safe house where a Vichy police trap had been laid. F section's first female agent, Virginia Hall, had also been invited to the meeting, but had declined the invitation. In total, 12 SOE agents were arrested when the meeting in Marseille was raided by French police and the arrested agents were taken in for questioning. The arrest meant that only three F section agents remained operational in Vichy, France. Francis Basson, who had arrived just a month before, and the locally recruited Dr. Levy. Virginia Hall also remained and was the only one with the means of transmitting information to London. So just who was she? Virginia was born in Baltimore in 1905. She attended schools in France, Germany and Austria. In 1931, at the end of her studies, she was appointed as consular service clerk at the American Embassy in Warsaw. Hall had hoped to pursue a career in the Foreign Service, but she suffered a horrific shooting accident, uh, which resulted in the loss of her lower leg. <clears throat> her injury disrupted her plans for a diplomatic career, <clears throat> and she resigned from the Department of State in 1939. She was residing in Paris when World War II broke out. She joined the ambulance service before France fell to the Germans and found herself in Vichy territory when the fighting ended in the summer of 1940. To cut a long story short, she managed to evacuate to London and quickly volunteered for the SOE. Her involvement with SOE meant that she was back in Vichy territory by August of 1941. She spent 15 months in Vichy helping to coordinate the activities of the French underground, as well as the occupied portions of France. And Virginia was not prepared to leave her colleagues to fester in a French jail, and she found out where they had been taken, keeping a close eye for any changes. A few days later, she learnt that the agents were being moved from Perigot prison to the Vichy internment camp of Moussac near Bergerac. Virginia recruited Gabby, the wife of Jean-Pierre Bloch, one of those arrested, in order to plan the escape. Meanwhile, Begay had managed to smuggle letters out to Virginia from inside the prison via Gabby, who visited the prison frequently to bring food and other items to her husband, including tins of sardines. Begay managed to turn these sardine tins into a key to the door of the barracks where the prisoners were kept. 
A priest also smuggled a wireless set to Begay and somewhat remarkably from within the prison walls, he began transmitting to London. Meanwhile, Virginia sorted out transport and helpers to get them away from the prison and safe houses in which to hide them. At 4 p.m. on the 15th of July, the prisoners awaited the signal to confirm that the escape was on, and sure enough, an old woman walked past the camp. If it had been an old man, the mission would have been aborted. At 3 a.m. on the 16th of July, 1942, they drugged their guard with a sleeping draft, unlocked the door of their hut with their sardine tin key, and escaped through the wire into a waiting lorry, which drove them to a forest hideout where they waited a week whilst an intense manhunt ensued. They left in twos and threes until in the middle of August, all of them met with Virginia in Lyon. She saw them onto an escape line which brought them across the mountains into Spain and eventually on into England. But for some having escaped across the mountains, they were arrested, including uh, Begay, and were held in Miranda del Albro camp. Eventually released in October, they were brought back to England. In London, Begay was awarded the Military Cross and became F Section's radio officer. He transferred to the Royal Signals on the 10th of February 1943 and remained with F Section until December 1944, when he resigned his commission and joined the French Army. The escape was dubbed as one of the war's most useful operations of its kind. As for Hall, uh, well, let me tell you about the other agents, because many of them did return to France, including Hayes, Louvet, Lyon and Trotterbus. Hall herself returned to London in July of 1943 and was made a member of the Order of the British Empire because the British government wanted to recognise her contributions. In fact, they wanted to give her a higher honour, but too much pomp and circumstance would have compromised her position as an operative. And in fact, she was so compromised that she could not continue work with SOE. She wanted to carry on work, but the head of F section told her no. She actually said, if I want to get a crick in my neck, it's my own business, but he refused. And so she went and joined the Office of Strategic Services, the American equivalent, and after the war became a founding member of the CIA. If you want to know more about her, she is mentioned in the book. Although only active in France for about six months, Begay created the foundation of Air Section's operations. He also recruited the first local contacts and assistants and established the first radio communication link to London and assisted in creating the first F Section network. By 1942, SOE had control of its own wireless traffic and established their first receiver at what had been STS 53. This formed the first building block in the organization's capabilities to independently handle their wireless communications. The first attempt by SOE to establish wireless communications with uh, occupied Europe was of a very basic nature. Once SIS dropped their objections to the establishment of a receiving station at Grendon Underwood, SOE constructed their first signal office in a downstairs room in the main house. As the transmitters and receivers had to be located in different areas, the organization established Grendon Underwood's partner facility at nearby Chandon, inside which were 18 250 watt transmitters. The limited capacity of this complex was, however, rapidly outstripped by SOE's increasing uh, traffic volume. This is a really famous picture taken uh, inside Grandon Underwood, uh, which now is a prison. SOE decided the solution to their problems was to build a dedicated facility and within six months of gaining operational control of their wireless networks from SIS, they began constructing their first purpose-built home station at Poundon in Oxfordshire. The transmitter was erected at Goddington. Poundon was larger than Grendon Underwood. The facility's receivers were installed in a purpose-built structure, which SOE installed at some 40 operating positions, of which over half were adapted for automatic sending. In an effort to economize on antenna, the organization also installed new wideband receiving amplifiers within their structure at Poundon. This gave them the ability to operate as many as 50 receivers simultaneously from each amplifier. And the transmitter complex for this new home station was also er um, erected at Goddington. SOE went from strength to strength and F section created some 75 plus different networks across the country. It's difficult to say because they, they came and they went as the war went on. As I said earlier, it included some 400 British trained SOE agents and thousands of locally recruited sub-agents from the French population. 
These circuits and many other groupings that SOE helped to arm undertook a considerable part in the sabotage of German road, rail and communications links up to and during the Allied landings in Normandy. The resistance learned about the imminent approach of the Allied invasions through the wireless and through Begay's invention, the message personnel, he didn't invent it, but his, his use of it for SOE. It was agreed there'd be a two-stage system of messages for SOE in preparation for D-Day, a standby message and an action message for each target. And on the 1st of June, 1944, the first of the standby messages came through and the agents knew that the invasion was at hand. The next days were full of activity as weapons were prepared, reconnaissance on targets was updated and supplies were gathered. On the 5th of June, the crucial message arrived from the BBC's radio launch. The attack was coming. That evening, action messages were heard by hundreds of agents, resistance and Maquis all the way across France. And those few hours before the first Allied troops landed on the Normandy beaches, over 960 sabotage strikes were made against French railway lines all across the country. This meant that many German soldiers who were desperately needed to repel the Allied invasion were turned to the task of hunting down and routing the resistance groups and quickly before they could hamper the German movements any further. These attacks on the transport network were crucial to the success of D-Day. With trains out of action and roads blocked, the Germans struggled to get reinforcements to the front and the work of the resistance helped cripple any potential for a significant counterattack. The SOE backed resistance also carried out their plans to attack German communications. Operation Violet saw 32 telecommunication sites destroyed and this meant that the Germans were forced away from the phone lines and back onto their wireless sets which could be readily intercepted. Unknown to Nazi high command, thanks to the breaking of the Enigma cipher machine by Turing and his team at Bletchley Park, the Allies could read a vast array of high-level signals and consequently the attacks on the phone lines by the resistance helped the Allies get access to German plans. At dawn on the 6th of June 1944, 160,000 Allied troops landed along the heavily fortified and staunchly defended 80 kilometre stretch of the Normandy coastline. They stormed five beaches, codenamed Sword, Juno, Gold, Omaha and Utah. The sheer scale of the invasion was unprecedented, comprising more than 5,000 ships and 13,000 other vessels. After 1,739 days of war, the liberation was finally underway. General Eisenhower, the Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force in Europe said that SOE's work in Europe played a very considerable part in our complete and final victory. And this last slide is of the Valencay Memorial. This was chosen as the site as that is where Begay dropped on that night uh, 80 years ago and, and some days now. Uh, today marks the first wireless message. The memorial is an absolutely beautiful thing if you ever get a chance to visit it. The cross in white and black representing the day and the night and the circle in the middle representing the full moon. So well worth a visit and uh, an annual commemoration is held there on the anniversary, anniversary of Begay's drop every year. And I understand that that happened a few days ago. So I very much hope you've enjoyed this talk. This last slide, I'm sorry, is some self-publicity, but that's what this is all about as well. Um, the book Mission France, uh, well, it's in some of the bookshops already. Here it is. Um, its official release is on Tuesday. So please, if you've enjoyed listening to me, uh, this story is mentioned in there and much more about Virginia Hall. But it's about the women's role uh, within F section itself.